Hello and welcome to Crossroads, the seismic story. Miyamoto Impact and the Catholic Archdiocese of Wellington have been working together for over 12 months on various seismic assessment projects for our churches and parish buildings, the Catholic Church of this region. What we've come to realise is that there's varying levels of uh, understanding and language use around seismic risk and risk in general. The hope of Crossroads, this event, is that together we can have a conversation to deepen our own understanding and find the right language and way of talking about risk to help people move forward and um, improve their buildings to deal and mitigate with uh, the seismic risk. So welcome to Crossroads, welcome to this highlights package. I hope it's useful to you and continue the conversation. If the seismic strengthening methodology is cost effective, then it really makes sense. In essence, this is all about life safety and preventing death. <clears throat> Buildings should come secondarily, and the, and the value of the building should come second to that. But by doing a pragmatic approach, learning from what has happened offshore, learning from our experiences from Christchurch, of which we've seen several, we can then put these into effect moving forward within New Zealand to have cost-effective solutions, which instead of distancing people from what is required and taking decades, to occur, we can do a lot more quickly and then have an effective outcome. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Methodist Trust Association, which is the investment and property arm of the Methodist Church of New Zealand. I look after their investments and their property, which includes their insurance portfolio, which was a really cushy job um, of several years ago and is no longer quite as pleasant as it was. I really commend the idea of cross-denominational meetings because in the end, the issues that we're dealing with at the administration level transcend any differences that there may be at a theological level or denominational level. And this is a really great place for us to start. All journeys start from somewhere. Pre-September, uh, in February 2011 in Canterbury we were pretty confident, the, the head office of the Methodist Church is in Christchurch, we were pretty confident that the insurance earthquake risk was somewhere else here basically. Um, we knew that Christchurch was not um, really on the map for seismic, uh, seismic activity uh, we knew that it would come uh, through Wellington and the wire wrapper as a property owner and as an owner of, of largely historic properties, we were waiting for the local authority, the Christchurch City Council, to work out what its earthquake prone seismic, uh, seismic building policy was going to be and we would then um, react to that and we would carry out the, the requirements that that gave us. Pre the earthquakes we also believed that the most expensive loss you could have was the loss of your building. I have to tell you that is not the most expensive loss you can have, especially if it's listed. The most expensive loss is the loss where it hasn't quite fallen down and they expect you to put it back. Post February 2011, we suffered three people killed in one of our churches. They were removing the organ and the, um, the building collapsed and killed them. That gives us probably, I think, a, a more poignant position and also a, a, a different starting point from a lot of property owners. We suffered the loss either through destruction or very significant damage of six churches, five halls and two parsonages. And I'll come on to e e EQC later. So we, we got to the road to recovery. We made a decision very early in the piece that we would manage all of the church claims centrally. We took the view, rightly or wrongly, that the parishes did not have the expertise in each individual parish to manage the claim. We ensure centrally, we thought we would do the claim centrally. We decided that we would do the easy properties first. We'd do the paint and paper. We would get as many buildings open again as many people into them as we could, runs on the board. We thought it gave us credibility with the church. If we could get those 24 buildings that were 
were knocked around but not, not badly damaged, open again and get them going. The other thing that was very important was regular contact with the church. We sent out newsletters uh, originally two weekly, then monthly, uh, sorry, weekly, then two weekly, then monthly, um, and we, we said what had happened, where it was good, we highlighted that, where it hadn't worked well, we also highlighted that because there is no point trying to pretend something isn't happening. The church, I'm sure the, the diocese is the same, everybody talks to everybody else and we had to be quite open as to what was happening. But keeping that communication going was hugely important. We constantly reviewed our claim. Um, this was really quite an eye-opener to us. We. Uh, after September, we were pretty confident that we'd sorted it out, and then February came and we were confident we sorted it out. And we thought we had a claim um, in June 2011 that was about $15 million. We finally settled at 43.5 plus GST. Um, that claim just grew exponentially as we got into our buildings and we found out the level of damage. So you didn't want to sign off too quickly because you, you, until you've really got into your buildings, you're not quite sure what the damage is going to be. We, we know what the policy says, but until you come to test it against the known event, you actually don't know what it means. The Haiti earthquake hit in 2010, and I was there two days after, and World Bank picked me up, and they asked me to assess about 50 different governmental buildings right after that. The earthquake is horrible killed almost 300,000 people, and I've damaged about 200,000 buildings. It's really, things happened here was bad, but it was nothing compared to what happened in Haiti, actually. So I stayed there for two years, and we trained about 600 Haitian engineers and about 6,000 masons, and with the uh, uh, USID funded and um, Red Cross and so on, uh, we assessed about 430,000 buildings and repaired about 20,000 buildings out there. And so that's what I do for a living. Here, issue is very different from what I saw in Haiti or Japan. Issue is, it's uh, more finance, more um, um, economy, more the real estate components. After all, yes, Christchurch earthquake was bad. We lost uh, almost 200 people. But 200 people out of 350,000 people, the performance was actually, believe it or not, in a building code point of view, it actually met intent of code. You know? And, but however, how society reacted to it is very unique, I thought. And it's very unique that how much insurance you had, now you don't have much anymore, and it's really causing, causing a lot of confusions here. It's kind of a, um, well, I don't say interesting, but it's a very unique uh, condition. Last uh, 30 years, myself and partners, we visited almost 100 different earthquakes, from Japanese one to, uh, U uh, to Asia to just Americas, just you name it. And the reason we do that is not only we train people uh, assess damage, but also we collect the data. We collect the, uh, how the buildings behave, how the actually seismic hazard, the, um, uh, how seismic vulnerability in the buildings and how we can control the risk. That is the, uh, one of the main reasons we are uh, at uh, disaster sites. And having that, we developed a database. We database, database basically tells us what realistically what's gonna happen to the building. And that's actually really important. Let me show you one example. This is a 26 story hotel. Uh, refurbished in 1995, and you kind of see that the little kink in the building, because two columns ruptured at the 11th level. No one died. Guess what? This is a total loss, but this met the intent of a building code, 100% of NBS, because intent of a building code is life safety only. It's nothing, to, nothing to do with the uh, uh, preserve the buildings or functions or anything like that. So that's an intendable code here in New Zealand and California and Japan, everywhere. So what about you design or built for 100% NBS? You're gonna see this. 
Now, what does the 100% of our building code means anyway? Well, that's why I said life safety. But I know it's an interesting thing going on. If you ask five engineers, chances you're going to get something between 5% to 150%. You know, you know that. Um, why is that? Well, let me tell you why. Building code is not really meant to be to use and um, gauge the capacity of existing buildings. I don't know how to do it. Building code is meant to be for new construction. The seismic behavior, um, or buildings behavior under seismic emotions are really complex. Building code is something try to deduce this really complex behavior to something very simple. You know, that's what building code is. It's true in Japan and California too. To analyze, evaluate, strengthen existing buildings is difficult. Seismic management, risk management. We have uh, essentially three different options. Well, number one is do nothing option, which we can do that for 15 more years actually. Because the government said that you have a, we have a 15 years to deal with it. Option two, buy the insurance, which was essentially what we did prior to the uh, earthquake. Because insurance are really cheap, really available, a lot of capacity, and it may really made sense. Option three is reduce the risk by the engineering and the construction, seismic strengthening, essentially. Our history of um, insurance as a body of um, churches is that we were fairly well fragmented until 10 years ago, and as well as being chair of All Churches Insurance um, Bureau, I'm chair of the Anglican Insurance Board, and Anglicans can be as fragmented as the wider church, and some cooperate and others do better elsewhere. Um, but we began by standardising our behaviour by finding a common insurer in Ansvar Insurance. This led us to using a common policy wording, which then makes it easier to make a claim. It's easier for the insurer to um, pick up a, a common policy, and I would immediately argue, therefore, it costs them less so the premiums can come down. Uh, we hit well, one voice who spoke to that insurer, but the December 2011 renewal was quite a shambles. Um, we were given 30 days notice that we would be finding another insurer. Uh, from my view, viewpoint and the Anglican Insurance Board, that meant that I had no insurer at all for the Christchurch diocese, <coughs> because at that point all the insurers had closed ranks and they weren't taking on new clients. The dilemma that's in front of us is, is what is good stewardship? We're not commercial property owners. We're people who happen to own some commercial properties, are they non-residential? But we've inherited some old buildings. The dilemma that's in front of us is, is what is good stewardship? We're not commercial property owners. We're people who happen to own some commercial properties, are they non-residential? But we've inherited some old buildings. <coughs> what we have learned to do, um, and in the Anglican Church we carry the first half million dollars of insurance in our own book, is that we have learned to throw some money in the bank or in the budget to cover the small amounts, so we're not dollar swapping with the insurer. That way the premium rate comes down. And if we look at dealing with the risk, I'd like to start with the idea that, as you're all aware, at Verdun, the French doctors invented triage just to deal with the huge volume of wounded that were coming towards them. So a doctor would stand there and say, that man's going to die anyway, put him over there. That man will recover on his own, let him recover over there, and the ones where our intervention will give them a chance of life, let them come through. If I apply that to our buildings, then we have some buildings that are must-have. If I went around the room, you'd all disagree on which buildings they are, but we would come up with some buildings that we must have. There are some buildings which are nice to have, and I suggest that there are some buildings that we ask, why do we have them? And that's where we can start, I think. We can start by saying, rather than saying, hey, this costs too much to insure, do we actually need to own it in order to insure it? I will ask you whether or not surplus buildings can be converted to another use and then on sold. <coughs> what we could do is say we don't want a particular church, let's sell it at a knockdown price, the developer grabs it, changes it into a restaurant, B&B, &B, whatever they change it into, and then makes a great deal of money out of it. Why don't we do that? Why don't we convert a church we don't want into a restaurant, find a chef, tenant it, and sell an ongoing business, and bank all that uh, developer's gain?
can I just acknowledge the two partners in this presentation for, if you like, the courage to bring people together and start talking about this stuff. We need to do more of it. There's an awful lot of mystique in this uh, business, an awful lot of terminology which often doesn't make sense and, and we need to all get our heads around it. So what I'm going to talk to you about is actually what we're doing as Wellington City Council in the market to actually talk about and communicate with people around earthquake risk for the city and so we need to have some context. It's our fault as a piece of work that we've been doing for nearly four years analysing the fault lines that run around and through Wellington to try and get a handle on so what is the risk? How, how big is this? We are surrounded by faults whether we like it or not and we are in an earthquake prone territory and that has some relevance for the strength of our buildings. And of course, you're asking, just as we're asking, when is the big one due? And more, and more recently, was the one we had on the 21st of July the big one? And the answer to that from the experts is, no it wasn't, but it was close in some respects. And we're probably lucky that it wasn't closer. So one of the things in the building trade that we talk about related to earthquakes is, is ground shaking. And this map uh, also is a GNS map and what it attempts to do is identify uh, the various levels of ground shaking that may occur in an earthquake. And if you look in particular to the, to the bright orange uh, kind of line that starts down in the Haast, goes up the west coast, crosses over the main divide, heads in through Hamna. Ever wondered why there's hot springs at Hamra? There you go. Uh, heads towards Wellington, Seddon even. <laughs> Interesting, eh? Then disappears into Cook Strait. So that is the area that's identified that is, uh, it's also partly the Alpine Fault but it's the area identified that is likely to cause the most ground shaking of any earthquake. 